Hello and welcome to the Tuck Colloquium. Um, this week we have Vida Dumovic, who is a professor at the University of Ottawa. Uh, she received her undergrad degree from the University of Zagreb and then moved to Canada where she got her master's and PhD from McGill University. Uh, she has a number of awards and prizes for her work, such as the Ontario Early Researcher Award, the Glinsky Award for Excellence in Research from the University of Ottawa. She's offered over 150 papers and conference papers in graph theory. Uh, her and her collaborators made this big breakthrough and revolutionary work on graph product structure theory, which has led to a number of very nice results in uh, coloring and the like in the last number of years, and in particular, they've now used it uh, for their most recent work, which we'll be talking about today, on their proof of the clustered Hadwiger conjecture. Uh, please join me in giving a round of applause and welcome to Vida Dumovic. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Luke, for a nice introduction. Um, I hope I'll deserve this applause at the end. <laughs> so this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I hope I will manage to give you an idea behind the proof. Uh, and actually, proof is in the title, so this, I'm trying to not have this be one of those where you kind of avoid too much of a proof. I'm not going to go in detail, but I want to give a big picture uh, to show you what is kind of new and different in how we used this product structure, if you like. So let me start by introducing my co-authors. They are my long time friends. Uh, more than 20 years for some of them, Pat Maureen and David Wood, we have been friends and collaborators since I was a student. And Louis Esper, he's a little bit younger, so not 20 years, but, but also a, a good friend and collaborator. So these results, uh, I was, Finally, the COVID finished, so I was happy to be on sabbatical last year. Part of it was in Grenoble, where Louis works. It's a beautiful city. Um, we enjoyed us there very much. So in the spring, we were there. That's in the office. Uh, we had a wonderful host who was making sure some of us stay alive. It was, uh, it was a really nice time. And during that whole uh, stay, actually, uh, we worked on this problem. It, it happened kind of accidentally, but that, you know, if I start talking about that, I'll never get to that proof. So um, there will be curtains in this talk. And as Jim noticed, uh, I don't know if I go out of this, uh, if you go to archive and look at the paper, there's a curtain uh, on, the, on the paper. And actually, that's the main tool. I'll try to just to convince you that something that has been there all along may be useful. I think it's probably, I haven't seen it before, but maybe Luke works a lot, uh, and Michelle and Sophie in this, uh, in this area. So maybe you'll correct me if you saw uh, something similar. Uh, like that. I mean, it's all, nothing is new. Just the way we use it is new. <laughs> Okay, so if, when you go to a theater, especially this old-fashioned theater, there's usually some fancy curtain, and at some point the show is about to start and the curtain rises, and uh, finally when the show ends, the curtain goes down, and to steal from Pat's his analogy, uh, at the end, when the curtain goes down, if the audience doesn't like it, maybe you're not going to like this one, you know, maybe they throw some tomatoes at the curtain. So there will be these type of activities uh, in this talk. Okay, so, uh, and this is kind of a, a summary of the proof, just to show you that really there are curtains, they will be raising of the curtains, and at the end, throwing some tomatoes on the curtain. <laughs> Don't worry if you don't know what this means. It would be very strange if you do. Okay, so, but let's go a little bit in history. To, let me give you some context. In uh, about, uh, what is this? Uh, 170 years ago, um, Francis Guthrie, uh, he was a student. Uh, he was a mathematician and botanist. He asked if... Um, the countries in a map can be colored with col col four colors. It's a, it's a famous problem. He observed that you need two colors and probably couldn't find a counter example to four colors. And that became a, a famous problem. 
one that can be converted easily into a graph problem where each region uh, you put a vertex, so each country you put a vertex here is these slides. These slides that are made electronically are by David. The slides that are made by hand, they will come, they're not. <laughs> so therefore, I guess that's why Australia is on the, on the screen. So, the, so you, for each region, you put a vertex, and you don't allow, obviously, two regions, uh, neighboring regions, to get the same curve, because otherwise you don't even know uh, where the borders are, where one starts and the other ends, and you connect them to regions if they share a boundary. So coloring um, region, if you do that, you have end, actually end up with a graph that is planar. It doesn't have edge crossings. This is something well known. Most of you, many of you, have, or most of you have seen this new undergrad. And um, the resulting graph is planar. And the, so the question is equivalent to can the planar graphs be colored with four colors? In this case, they can, in this simple example, they can be colored with four colors, probably with less than four colors. I don't know, less than four colors. All right. So this problem was open for more than 100 years, and it was solved in 77. There were many kind of iteration and a simpler proof, uh, all using computer, was later discovered by Robertson and Seymour, uh, and there is kind of a how would you say, the proof verifier proof that was done um, in 2008. So somehow this is, uh, we now know that planar graphs are four colorable and this are, result is very well verified. And what we typically do when we have nice results like this, we would like to generalize them. I and we ask to ask, um, can you do something similar for other classes or more general classes of graphs? So a generalization that I will look at, these are uh, graphs that are closed undertaking minors. So what does that mean? Uh, so a graph H is a minor of graph G. If you can obtain this graph H, think of it as a smaller graph, if you can obtain it from G um, by either deleting edges, not either, or you can combine all these operations, deleting edges, deleting vertices, and contracting edges like here. So if you can obtain a graph H uh, from graph G by doing edge deletions, vertex deletions, and edge contractions, uh, then we say that the resulting graph is a minor of H. OK, so planar graphs are well known not to have K5 as a minor. And it's easy to check that K5 uh, is not a planar graph, at least if you know Euler formula, it simply has too many edges. And these operations, uh, deleting edges, so if you have a drawing of planar graph without crossing, if you delete an edge, the graph is still planar. If you delete a vertex, the graph is still planar. If you contract it just like this, the graph is still planar. So we certainly cannot con create K5. So if we start with a planar graph, then that graph is also K5 minor free. So then, like the first obvious question is, are K5 minor free graph, are they four colorable? But why start there at five? Let's start at one. So here's what is kind of easy and has been known for a long time. So the graph that doesn't have a K1 as a minor, doesn't have vertices, so it's zero colorable. It's easy to see that the graph that doesn't have a K2 as a minor, so it doesn't have an edge as a minor, then it's simply a set of uh, disjoint vertices, so all of them can be colored the same color. If the graph doesn't have a K3 as a minor, then it doesn't have cycles, therefore it's a forest, so all the forests, all the trees, it's easy to color them with two colors. Um, graphs that exclude K4 as a minor, they're actually planar. Uh, they are quite simple graphs, and, and it's not difficult to show. They, all, they have a, a vertex of degree 2, if I'm not lying. <laughs> so then the greedy coloring gives you uh, uh, three coloring. So what we learned from uh, four-color theorem is that um, uh, the, the trend continues. So we can see that actually 
we look at the number of vertices of the complete graph that we're excluding, and it seems that the number of color is one less. Okay, so the trend continues, but with much more difficult proof. And what about K6? So for, for these kind of graphs, we we've kind of know their structure. So for, K, for the graphs that exclude K6 minor already, we really don't know what the structure of these graphs is in any kind of precise way. We kind of have Robertson and Seamers. Uh, graph minor structure theorem, but we don't have a nice structural result like series parallel graphs. They have a nice, uh, it, it's an easy structural uh, result that allows you to color them with three colors. But yet, with lots of work, Robertson, Seymour, and Thomas in 93 proved that five colors are enough for K6 minor free graph. And that's where that trend stops. So we don't know if K5 minor free graphs are six color. Uh, K7 minor free graphs are six color. But if you look at these numbers, you may guess that um, that it may be true for all H. So if you exclude, so that's what. Um, Hadwig conjectured in 1943, he conjectured that every KH minor three graphs is H minus one colorable. Okay. At the time, he actually didn't know the four color theorem was not known. So he didn't know this result, neither that it's true for K5 minor three nor for K6 minor three. Uh, so it was an interesting guess. Uh, and made very early on. We are still very far from it, but there was some huge progress made. I'm sure you know about that, because the huge progress was made by people in this room. <laughs> so for the longest time, more than, not more than, but almost 40 years, the best we knew was that graphs that exclude KH as a minor can be colored with H times log H to the half. But this is actually the generacy, in other words, of, of graphs that exclude KH minor. In other words, it was known from that result that every graph that excludes a KH as a minor has a vertex of a degree at most this. But then you can do greedy coloring and color with that many, many colors. So then we were stuck at this degeneracy bound for almost 40 years before um, uh, Luke Postel and Norin and Song, they made a first breakthrough in reducing this bound. And then uh, there was more progress made. And currently, uh, Michelle and Luke, this is the best bound so far. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is really incredible progress. So what we would, uh, so I put here, what you would really like to do is to, I mean, next, obviously, is to get rid of this log log n, to, to understand uh, can kh minor free graphs be colored with O of n color? That's what it says behind this, behind this box. I mean, of course, Hadwiger conjectures something much stronger, not just O of h. He conjectures something super precise. Actually, there's an easy lower bound, which is a complete graph. So this is super strong. I don't know how much belief is there that the conjecture is true. Do we, people who really work on it, do you think it's true? I, maybe, I, I don't, I mean, I'm guessing this is all of our evidence. This is not a small evidence, but it's also not a very big evidence. So it's, it's a really interesting area, and by the way, by, uh, by most, this is, I, I think by most graph theories, this is considered the, the biggest problem in graph, graph theory. This is, these are arguable topics, but I mean, many people would argue this is one of the uh, most important problems in graph theory. But that's not what we worked on because we can't solve that. <laughs> At least not the four of us that were working on it, nor did we even try. What we looked at is uh, when you can't prove something, we kind of weaken it. Let's try to prove uh, something a little bit less strong. So I'm going to introduce kind of a non-proper graph coloring, so-called clustered graph coloring. 
And there you say that a graph can be colored with k colors, if each vertex gets one of k colors, okay? Uh, but I allow some clustering, and I say the coloring is with clustering C. If you look at a um, graph induced by one color class, then the connected component in the color class are at most C. So that has to be true for each, um, for each uh, color class. So a graph induced by each color class has connected component of size at most C. So for example, in this little example here, this is, uh, there are three colors, red, blue, and green. And so this is a tree coloring of this graph with clusters of size at most two. So C here is two and K is three. And properly, you cannot color this properly with, with four, with three colors because we have a K four here. So it gives you some extra, extra power. Okay, so what's known about the clustered coloring. Uh, you can rephrase four color theorem by saying planar graphs are four color but with clusters of size one. So each, uh, in the, each color class induces an independent set. Um, but this is a difficult proof, but there is a cute and easy proof from 86 if you allowed uh, clusters of size two. So planar graphs can be colored with uh, two colors, uh, with four colors, and clustering at most two with an easy proof. And actually, interestingly, you would think, I mean, the idea would be also, when can you improve the number of colors? Okay, can you reduce the number of colors for the color class, uh, for the graph class, if you allow uh, clusters of size bigger than one? And in case of planar graphs, the answer is no. Uh, the, you cannot color, no matter what C you give me. If you fix C, I'll find a planar graph for you that cannot be colored with four colors and the clusters of size C. The example actually is very simple, is this graph here. This thing here is a path, just a long path, make it as long as it's enough to, to get a counterexample. I mean, it's related to your chosen C. So one thing, this vertex here dominates everything. So let's say it gets a color red. And then you have these copies of these triangular graphs, many, many copies of these triangular graphs. So that means that these dominating, these vertices that dominate these triangular graphs, uh, one of them eventually has to be non-red because I'm gonna put so many of these copies of these triangles that if you put them all red, then you're gonna get the big cluster because this vertex dominates it. You're gonna get a star that is bigger than C. So this vertex, say, gets a different color. So now we look at the graph inside. You have a path dominated by both of these vertices. So this vertex, there can be only a constant C of them, C red vertices here. They can be only C green vertices here. But if this path is long enough, there is still one ginormous, long, unbroken path. You cannot color it with one color, otherwise you're gonna have a big connected component. You need at least two colors for long path to get, um, to get uh, coloring of the path. You need uh, at least two colors for any constancy uh, you give me. So this graph, so planar graphs require four colors. So actually this clustering doesn't help you reduce number of colors. It does, oh, but let me introduce an interesting concept actually. I found the, the definition interesting, which is a clustered chromatic number. So what you're interested in for, for a class is the minimum number of colors such that there exists a constant for that class, such that all the graphs in the class can be colored with that many colors, and uh, the, the clustering is at most that constant. Okay, does that constant exist? So we just learned that for planar graph, this cluster chromatic number is not three because such a constant doesn't exist. And in fact, it's four with a constant one. All we really want with this cluster, cluster chromatic number is that there is a constant so that the clusters are bounded. Okay, so you're asking what's the minimum number of colored such that the color, such that the graph class can be colored 
with bounded clusters. That's what we're interested in. So let's see what was no, what's known for non-planar graphs. We've seen that uh, it doesn't help reduce number of colors in non-planar graphs, but it turns out it makes huge difference for, for example, for graphs embeddable on surfaces. Uh, Dvorak and Norin, they proved that they're all full colorable. So where then the cluster, size of the cluster depends on the genus. But if genus is fixed, then you have the graphs embeddable on a, on a surface of fixed genus uh, have cluster chromatic number four. All right. By the way, this example, for those of you who are familiar with 3 with, and somehow it will appear, but I will try not to, well, we'll you'll see. Uh, this graph actually has 3 with 3. Okay, this is not only a planar graph, but it has 3 with 3, and it needs four colors. But every graph of 3 with 3 can be four colored because every graph of three with three, even if you don't know what it mean, what they are, they are, these graphs have always a vertex of degree at most three. So you can use greedy coloring to color them with four colors. So the, there are graphs of three with three that require four colors, actually in any in a clustered coloring. And this example can be generalized. You just take many copies of this and add one dominating vertex you get a graph of three with one larger than that, and you need one more color. So for the three with also, it doesn't help, in fact. So the result is that proper coloring of graphs of bounded three, uh, graphs of three with T is T plus one, but also clustered uh, chromatic number, is, that's the best possible for clustered chromatic number. Okay, so what we are really interested in, we have seen that it makes a big difference for surfaces. So what we really want to answer is an analog, so clustered analog of Hadwiger's conjecture. So we want to know, uh, is it true that for every h, there exists some constant c of h, such that every k h minor free graph has h minus one coloring with clusters of bounded size, of size f of h, okay? So we want the size of the clusters to depend only on that h. It's going to be, we don't care what that function is, as long as the function exists. <coughs> so that is the, the main problem and the topic of this talk is going to be to prove this result. Uh, are there questions at this point? OK. OK, so what was known before, there was a Oh, as I already mentioned, that same lower bound actually, that were for planar graphs when h is 5 works for every h. So h minus 1 is best possible for the, so that result uh, is tight, the same as in proper coloring. And then there was a series of papers when this topic was kind of introduced. There was a series of results proving at least linear bound, unlike uh, uh, real uh, Hadwiger conjecture, where we don't have a linear in H bound. Uh, in 2007, there was a first linear bound on the number of colors uh, with some function. All of these proofs, except actually this one here, use a structure theorem. So there was a continuous improvement uh, of these results uh, over the years. In fact, in this paper, Edwards, Kang, Kim, Um, and Seymour, they asked what is now known as a clustered, they ask whether H minus one is correct. Uh, so that's what we're going to answer today. Okay, so that's the result. Um, sorry, I lo in the hotel I lost my glasses, so now I'm gonna be, this is gonna be a bad video. This is, <laughs> okay, I guess, what is so, all right. Okay, so the result is that H minor three graphs can be colored with H minus one colors uh, with bounded cluster sizes, or in other words, clustered chromatic number of H minus three graphs is H minus one. Okay, so, oh, by the way, a very important note. This result was announced in 2017 by Dvorak and Norin. I believe in that paper where they proved that uh, surface graphs have clustered chromatic number at most four, they announced this result. 
But this result hasn't been written, uh, not that we know of and we checked with them. And uh, so I'm looking forward to it actually because their result, and it's, I think it'd be great to have both. First of all, they claim uh, that their result gives uh, choosability, not just colorability. And surely the techniques are very different because um, they announced this in 2017 and we found these structure, these product structures and in 2000, two years later. So I, I would imagine that they're very different techniques. Uh, so I, I am looking forward to uh, seeing their result. I think they're actually writing it. Maybe it helped that some, something came out with some curtains were on archive. Okay, so what are the tools that we are going to use? Obviously we are working on, we want to prove something on KH minor free graphs. We need to know what these graphs look like if we're going to prove anything on them. So we are going to use the graph minor structure theorem. Um, so by Robertson and Seymour, in fact, a kind of a stronger version by Dvorak and Thomas. And that was really critical for us to have at hand. And I'm going to tell you what, which stronger version uh, I, I mean. Usually, we will also use um, a tree with results that were known in the past, although we're going to completely rework this. I, I don't really want to go in detail, but where for many of these problems, you often know how to solve a problem on bounded tree with graphs. This one's kind of complicated because we don't have a good bound for bounded tree with, but I, I'm going to get there. But this is kind of useful tool uh, if you uh, know how to solve a problem on bounded tree with. We're going to use the product structure theorem, as uh, Luke mentioned, that we discovered in 2019 and since then found many nice uh, applications to it, although this one is really quite different. And islands, we do use these islands. We were at H, we were stuck at H. And then the techniques by Dvorak and Noring and Esper, they use these islands, but that part I'm not going to talk about. That helped us finally go down. Okay, so first tool, Graph minor structure theory. This is not the simplest theorem to state. I will just explain what do these graphs look like, and then I'm going to convert them into a curtain. <laughs> so, um, so the Robertson Seymour proved in a series of I don't know how many papers, ten more, that graphs that exclude, let's say, kh as a minor, can be constructed from click sums of almost embeddable graphs. So undefined terms, click sum, and almost embeddable. Let me just define click sum, and then I'll explain immediately a difficulty. So click sum is operation, so you have two disjoint graphs. So a click sum is an operation of these two disjoint graphs, g prime and g second. You have to find a click in one. You can only glue them on click. You have to find a click on another, and you identify the vertices. You just kind of glue these things together, and then you're allowed to, in the, only in that click, you're allowed to erase some edges. That's a click sum. So if you didn't know anything else, maybe your strategy to color a graph would be something like this. Oh, you colored already um, G prime, I don't know why it says now G1. You color already G1, and now you want to color G2, but Notice that these vertices are part of uh, G2 as well, so they are pre-colored. Okay, so you want to color these two together, but then when you're coloring G2, here's what the difficulty that happens with this clustered coloring. So imagine you had some green cluster here. It was constant size. But now uh, this, uh, vertex, this pre-colored vertex that was green, so you want to color the rest of G2, this pre-colored vertex, do you want to give it neighbor also green? Not really, because you're, then you're, this component, this green component that was constant start, start bleeding into G2. And you may be doing click sum on the same click unbounded many times. So even if you just add one green neighbor, you, are, you may be in trouble, because I may be doing click sum repeatedly on the same click, and then this grows unbounded. So what you want is that when you do a click sum, although you have that all the neighbors inside of here, you want to block these clusters from bleeding in 
into the, the, the graph that you didn't color. So you want the neighbors to be properly colored with respect to this thing, so not get the same color. But that is really a big problem in Robertson and Seymour's thing. Uh, Robertson and Seymour structure theory mode, I only define click sum. Remember, we want, for some reason, I think I'm having, just a second. Oh, OK. So remember, this was supposed to be h minus 1. It was some older version. So remember, we are going for, we are going for h minus 1. This clique in Robertson and Seymour's uh, structure theorem can be huge. So this is the biggest problem that we encounter. You're gluing two graphs on, it's bounded in H. So you're looking at a graph that excludes KH as a minor. You're gluing some pieces that hopefully you know how to do these pieces. You're gluing them on cliques, and you want to do inductive coloring. But the problem is these cliques can be huge, exponential in H. And you want to color it such that these neighbors with only h minus 1 color, and this joint thing has exponential size in h. So this is really a big problem. I mean, you can immediately see the problem. If, all, if your h minus 1 allowed colors are green, blue, and red, and you have a vertex here that is adjacent to everybody, you can make it proper. You're in trouble immediately. So the fact that these click sums are huge, it's really a big problem that we were stuck on for a long time. OK. Okay, and so what are these? Uh, so what are these? So what's the other unknown word in that almost embeddable? So click sums, that's what it is. So this is just operation, gluing on a click and possibly deleting some edge. And what are you gluing together to get, get these graphs? You're glu drawing, gluing together something called almost embeddable graphs. So I'm going to show you what they are by picture. So. Or rather, so in Robertson Seymour's structure theorem basically says that you have a sequence of disjoint graphs, so G1, G2, G3, they have nothing in common. Each one of them is this almost embeddable graph. And then what you allow to do is one by one you perform a click sum. You take a first graph, you take a second, find some click here, find some click here, glue them and possibly delete some edges. So now these two are connected. Now you pick next one and perform a click sum, find the click, and so on. OK, so, there's a, these are, so you have a sequence of graphs. Each is almost embeddable. You're allowed to pre perform click sums. So what are these? What do these graphs look like? I need to be able to color these. So here's a picture. OK, so that's, that's what I was actually explaining without. All right. Ah, by the way, when I mentioned three bits. So let's look at this. So these pieces, GI, you're doing click sums on them, and each is almost embeddable. When these pieces, when each of these pieces has size at most t, let's say t is some constant, and the cliques that you're gluing on have size at most t minus 1, then the resulting graph actually has 3 with t. That's a definition. It's one of those equivalent definitions. Okay? So you can use this type of picture to define both. That's what I was trying. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do. Okay, so the previous picture can be turned into a tree. You can say that these graphs can be com Compose by starting with one of those graphs, and then you do a click, let's say G1, and then you do a click sum of G2 to G1, then maybe you take a next one, G3 is click sum to G1 as well, then maybe you take a next one, G4 is click one to G2, and you can represent it as a tree. So this is like a what is called tree decomposition, where each node is one of those almost embeddable graphs. Okay. And in this, in this representation of 
graphs that exclude KH as a minor in, this, in general in these 3D composition, 3D compositions, if you take any edge, that's what represents a clique sum, any of these edges is actually a cut set. So the vertices that are in that cliques, these are the only vertices that are on both sides of the edge, in the graph in the both sides of the edge. So this is a cut set. So it kind of, this is where this idea comes from that if you take a look at an edge in 3D composition, on one side you have, over an edge, you have a graph G prime, on the other side of the edge you have a G second, and you glue them on, um, on, a, uh, on a clique, hopefully of small size. So that's kind of too fast, probably, introduction of the graph that exclude cage as a minor. So now what do these pieces look like? This is all from Robertson and Seymour structure theory. OK. All right. So in order, first of all, we have to solve two problems. First, how do you color, color each of these pieces? So we have these pieces, and then we have to solve how do you glue them together? OK, how do you, you color one? It's already colored, then I bring a new piece, I want to attach it, and you, you want to color it. But in order to do that, you have to first of all color each of these pieces, these almost embeddable graphs. OK, so how do you color each of them? You have to be able, first of all, to color with H minus 1 colors. OK, let's do that. So what does GI look like? So what are these almost embeddable graphs? I'll show you in a picture. So you start with a surface. There is a little whatever sigma here. You start with a surface. These almost embeddable graphs are graphs that first you can draw them on a surface with no crossing. So these are surfaces of bounded genus, where genus depends only on H. So you start with crossing free drawing on a surface. So you are looking at a surface graph, bounded genus graph. But that's unfortunately not it. Otherwise, we would already know we can do it with four. Remember from Dvorak and um, Norin's result. But then there's a constant number of, think of it as faces, where there's some non-planarity, some mess, but it's kind of control mess. Okay, so, so these are called vortices, these, these messes here. Then that's not all for the mess. Then there's a constant number of vertices that are allowed to connect only to this mess. Okay, but this constant is actually big, exponential in a f of h. That's a constant we cannot control. We call these um, non-major, these are called apex vertices, but we actually, these are special ones because they are only allowed to connect to this mess, to these vortices, okay? And they are really bad guys. These are major, so-called major apices. They can connect to anything. And imagine, that you're so happy you managed to, to color everything so far, including this mess and this mess, and you have a nice number of colors. And then comes these ones, they can connect to everything. So all of these connected, these, these clusters of the same size, you can just glue them all together. You give it the same color, you, it becomes one ginormous monochromatic component. So you may have um, even just in the red independent set, and then this vertex you're forced to give it red color, and you have a huge monochromatic component. So these are really bad. But there is uh, this theorem by Thomas and uh, Dvorak says that the number of these is not some crazy f of h exponential function. It's actually h minus 5. That's a really nice number. And that's when we started getting unstuck. Apparently, this is something that people who are super deeply understand products, uh, the graph minor theorem, they kind of knew this. At least that's what uh, uh, the Robin Thomas and, and Wojak, they say this is kind of well known in the graph structure community. But we are finally writing this proof because they need it for something. So I'm really happy this is written. Uh, the, the, this proof is written, so the number of these bad guys is h minus 5. Okay, so this is what almost embeddable graphs look like. And we want to color them. These are our pieces, and then we have to do click sums. 
Okay, so we have to be able to color one of these guys, each one of these guys with H minus one colors if we wanna have any hope of, of progressing. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, first of all, here, this is the same picture except that I removed this mess because even, even in the picture you see how messy it is that these are. These purple guys are really bad. I can't even show you what I want to show you. <laughs> so imagine the, the, these, these um, I, oh, but this is not showing up. I had a nice coloring. OK, this doesn't show up. There is a little green. Can you see it? No, I guess not. Doesn't matter. So if you look at this graph, if you ignore this mess, there's constant numbers of these faces and mess and things touching the mess. Everything else, let's say one away, distance one, from, from this mess. It's actually in the surface. And we know how to do that actually with four colors. This is way better than H, H minus one, okay? So we know how to do this. What we know about this thing is basically that it has bounded tree width, this thing here. Okay, but that is not, um, that is not what we use. So here's what we, what we really use. So here's a product structure that um, Luke mentioned. So here what, what we showed, I, I'm gonna state it in terms of planar graphs, but we actually prove it for, for, for these guys, Spe uh, without the, the ugly guys, without H minus five ugly guys. Okay, um, so, so, so what we proved in 2019 is in a way kind of clarifying what is the structure of planar graphs. What is the structure of these graphs that live on surfaces? And it says that every planar graph and also bounded genus graphs, graphs and surfaces, it's a subgraph of a strong product of two graphs that we really understand well. Typically, we understand very well. In fact, one of them is just a path. We know everything. We can solve everything on a path. And the other is a graph of three with at most eight. I think for services is nine, but these constants have improved since. It doesn't really matter. It's some really small constant. So every planar graph is a product, is a subgraph of a product of a path and some bounded three with graph. Remember, somehow bounded three with graphs, usually we can do stuff on them. Sometimes with a lot of effort, actually in this paper with a lot of effort, but, but usually you can hammer it. You, you can really work on, on them and, and get some strong results because they're kind of like tree-like graph class. Okay. And you see, actually, it looks like a grid. That somehow they're like you're repeating this bounded three with graph H. You're repeating like it in a grid-like way, if you like, because you're multiplying it by a path. This is a strong product, so they're also diagonals. I don't want to explain that. But that was not good enough for... We had to use the way we actually proved it in 2019 for these almost embeddable graphs. And the way we proved it tells you more. So the way we prove that is actually we show that, think of it as all bounded genus graphs, all planar graphs, and even these almost embeddable graphs. You can find a breadth for search layering, so layering of the graph. Why I say breadth for search, it's important. It doesn't have to be breadth for search, but it's important that the edges are only allowed uh, within a layer. So, so breadth for search gives you a layering. So each edge of a graph is within a layer or between two consecutive layers. So even that is kind of, that's why you get times apart. That's kind of like a grid-like thing. So we show that in, in a breadth, for, if you take any breadth for search layering, so you get the layering of a graph, that you can partition the vertices of the graph into paths. This yellow thing is supposed to represent these vertical paths. Think of them as columns such that if you contract these columns, you get a graph of three with at most eight, okay? So it's kind of stronger, it's a minor. You get a minor. I, it has to be a minor because I need to maintain that it, this KH minor free, this graph I'm working, working with. Okay, but there's, a, there's some, so here's actually, we're starting to get a curtain. 
So I'm going to represent this as a kind of a drape of a curtain. OK, so what I said is actually not true, kind of, when you get close to these vortices. So what we actually get from our um, structure, from, from the proof of our product structure theorem, is that each of these almost embeddable graphs looks like that. This. It's, it's actually, it, it, I think it's kind of useful, helps you prove things. You have layers. We still have layers. Other than, except for these uh, H minus 5, these major apices, except for these bad apices, imagine they're not there. All the other vertices live in their own layer, layer L1, L2. These are ordered layers. And edges, again, only go between the layers and within a layer. So everywhere here, edges are on the, uh, the vertices are on the layer, and uh, edges are within and across. OK. You can, again, partition the vertices. OK. And this partition is actually a path. Unless you kind of, when you start getting here, things get messy. But I'm not going to contract that. So what we're going to do, so I have these vertices. I have a partition into paths here. I'm going to contract them all up into maybe layer three. I'm not going to go all the way. I'm not, I don't want to get close to the mess. So the graph will actually be a minor of the original graph, still a KH minor. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to get a graph of bounded tree with, so I can do something with it. OK, so here's what that actually looks like. So vortices are in the first place, so the mess. Uh, vortices, non-major apices, they all live in the first layer. Then from layer two onwards, the graph is of bounded genus. It's a surface graph, the, the one that we can color with four colors. So we have all the messes in the first layer, vortices and main, minor apices. Everything else lives down here. So I contract this. When you contract, let's say, into five layers. So if I contracted to the end, I would get that H from the product structure, bounded tree with the graph. It's not difficult to show that if I stop five layers away, you still bounded tree with. OK, so the graph is still, uh, so I end up, this graph here is bounded tree width. OK, so this is what my graph, I end up, so I start with this um, almost embeddable graph. I tell you it looks like a drape. And then because I want to color it, and I know supposedly how to do bounded tree width graphs, I contract it into fifth layer, everything until maybe fifth layers, and I stop. The resulting graph has a constant tree width. OK. So how does that help? So here's how it helps. We can color that with H minus 1 colors. OK. So what does the, the statement say? It says that every graph, it may, suppose this is true. Every graph of bounded tree width, so constant tree width, that doesn't have k h minus 1 t, this is some bigger constant, as a subgraph. Imagine I tell you that can be colored with h minus 1 colors. OK? So this is actually a lie. It's not really true. There is an asterisk there, but you can imagine that it's true, because otherwise this talk would be even messier. So, so, OK. So, I get what I want if the graph has bounded tree width. It does have bounded tree width. But it's supposed to not have kh minus 1 t as a subgraph. OK, why does it not have kh minus 1 t as a subgraph? First of all, the graph g itself. Forget now, this is, forget almost embeddable. The whole graph, since it's kh minor, kh minor free, then is it is, that implies that it's kh minus 1, h minus 1 free. That's not difficult to see, because here's your kh minus 1, h minus 1, where, when h minus 1 is 4. You can contract all the pairs but the top two, and you get a complete graph on h vertices. You get uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this case. 
Okay, so from k h minus 1, k h minus 1, uh, you can get uh, k h minus. So the graph to begin with g is, doesn't have k h minus 1 t as a minor, therefore it doesn't have as a subgraph. But I now started doing things here. Why, why is it that I don't have k h minus 1 t as a as a, my, as a subgraph, as a subgraph. The reason is that, oh, I was giving this in a wrong order. Well, first of all, actually, let's go in that order so you will see why this is, this is useful in the one that I'm presenting here. So imagine for now that this is really true. I didn't tell you why this doesn't have k h minus 1 t as a subgraph. You apply this lemma, you can color this with h minus 1 colors. OK, but how does, does that help? I have to now unroll this curtain, or oh, actually drape. I have to unroll the drape, and I get long. Let's say if this was, uh, there was a, a vertex here that was contracted and colored red, and it was a singleton component. Now you let the curtain drape down, and you have a long path, for example, in all red. Okay, so what would be really good is that if I could save a color. Okay, so because I'm, so this is supposed to be the trolling. So if I let the, this drape go down, I would like to have an extra color to break these long components with that extra color. Okay, that's where tomatoes are added. Curtain. <laughs> so how do I save a color? How do I save a color here? And um, how do I save a color here? I, I'm already tied. I have H minus um, one things. Well, you do something strange. It's strange that it works, but it does. One of the reasons it works, you add a dominating vertex to the last layer. And you pre-color it, let's say, blue, like in this picture, and say, you are not, these guys, the neighbors are not allowed to be blue. So that's going to be my saved color. It may seem strange, why would this work? But remember, from layer two to four, this is now surface. You are far away from the mess. So somehow, that is intuitively why I believed it, it would work, but we managed to make it work. But now let's look at this lemma. Nothing really changed. Adding a dominating vertex, one, one single dominating vertex to bound the tree with the graph, the graph is still bound the tree with those who study the, this is obvious. So the graph still has this condition, bound the tree with. Okay, why does it not have kh minus one t? Okay, that is, you know, you're adding a dominating vertex. But it's because this, from two to four, this is a surface. The only complete bar pi tie graph that you can find in a surface is K2T, big one. You don't have K3T in a surface, or K3 of G in a surface. There is no big complete graph with three vertices on one side. Okay, so actually when you do this counting, so when you do the counting, so let's try to count. Okay, so why don't you have kh minus 1t, because this was really a key, one of the keys. Why don't you have kh minus 1t subgraph? First of all, when you, you, you are safe when you are rolling up. Again, because it's a surface. When you roll up, there is no k3t here. The K, the complete bipartite graph, lives only on three layers. The diameter of complete bipartite graph is three. So if you found now KHT, either it was in the first three layer, but we never touched them. We didn't get, we didn't contract anything past first three layer. That's why I stopped. Okay, so if, I, if there's KHT all of a sudden, because I did a contraction, if there is a KHT, it cannot be in the first three layers, because I didn't even get close there. But it cannot be in the last three layers, because that's a surface. I contracted something on a surface. There is no K3T in the surface. Okay? So well, how much do we have? There is no K3T in the surface. I added this one. There's no K4T in the surface. And H minus 5 here, so that's 4 plus H minus 1, that's 8. 4 plus h minus 5, that's h minus 1. It works. 
that there is no kh minus 1 t as a subgraph. So even the adding this, there has to be another with some pre, you know, this works with a pre-colored vertex. There is a lie, pre-colored vertex, but I managed to save a color. So when I lower this curtain, so these were these long red components, long yellow components because they all went down. But now there is a H minus one uh, in here. Th that was the part, this is the part we didn't touch, the one from layer six onwards where you enrolled. But there we only used H minus two colors because there was that color that was saved, which was the, this blue color. And then really I can use it just to, to block these, uh, to break these components apart and put them two apart so they don't connect in, in the layering. Okay. And plus I also lied here because this only works if you're ignoring major apices. Because now in that picture, it works for all of what I said but now you unroll, do this, and now these guys come and glue everything together. So that, I'm not going to go into that. But actually, this strategy could be made word with, even with this H minus 5. Okay, I'm getting to the end. It doesn't look like I'm getting to the end, but I am. <laughs> so say we can do H minus 1. Now we know we can do H minus 1 for every piece of Robertson and Seymour's uh, structure theory. And, but then we are still have this big problem. When you look at that three decomposition, let's say we can do this one with H minus one color. Now I have to glue G3 and this is a ginormous clique. Okay, maybe this clique sum is small at most. Uh, they proved, so from that fact that there is at most H minus five major apices, uh, that implies that uh, in that there is at most the clique sum in some cases there is at most h minus two rather clique sums that involve surface vertices are of size at most h minus two so i'm going to get to that so some of these clique sums are big what we learned from dvorak and thomas is the following that some of these clique sums are big but they are big only if they involve the top of the drape if you are doing click sums of two drapes, so two almost embeddable graphs, if that click sum is big, then both of those clicks in those two drapes are in the first layer, are in the messy part. Okay? Otherwise, it's actually not big. It's at most H minus 2. That's a nice number. We can even save a color. H minus 2 is one away from H minus 1. So we change. So what we're going to do, so this is the, 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 what it made it work. We perform these big click sums ahead of time because we cannot do them inductively. We cannot pre-color glue then again. You perform big click sums before any coloring. Okay, so that's the same as saying you label this 3 decomposition. This is a picture. And let's say I'm going to label with I. Uh, the edges that involve small click sum and with, with two eyes, the, let's say the three is big in, my, in this silly example, small click sum, uh, you label edges as big click sum, small click sum. So these red ones are big click sums, these are small click sum. And you perform these ahead of time. And remember all the big click sums are on the top of the drape. So when you perform them, what does this graph look like? So you have a drape, and you glue them only on the top. And you take another drape and glue it only on the top. So it's like some curtain, OK? So this is, a, so this is, so for example, you perform this ahead of time because the edges are red. So here, so instead of having a 3D composition where the bags are almost embeddable graphs, we now get 3D composition that looks like this where each bag of a 3D composition is actually a curtain, okay? So you already performed click sum. It really looks like a curtain, like sheets of paper that you just, how do you call this? You have this thing 
oh yeah, I'm definitely that'd be good analogy. You staple them. You take a sheet, but you're only allowed to staple on the top, some locations in the top. So now you have a theorem that every K5 minor free graph has a 3D composition. Forget these parameters here, where each node in the 3D composition is a curtain. And these click sums are small, they are size at most h minus 2. And I can tell you we can do that. Now these click sums we can do. But you should ask, well, but this, and this, this is not a drape anymore. Can you do a curtain now? Okay. But look at this curtain. It's really each sheet is like, each sheet is this, is this drape. You can lift the whole curtain. You still get bounded tree with graph. I mean, the same, here's a picture of that. I have a picture of that coloring the curtain. It's the same, same, same algorithm strategy. So instead of just lifting one drape, you lift now each curtain. So when you lift one drape, this is a bounded tree with graph. This is a bounded tree with graph. But think how we glued them together. So we have bounded tree with graph that we glued on small cli on clicks, bounded clicks. But those who study bounded tree with know that that graph too has a bounded tree with. So when you raise a curtain, the whole curtain, it has a bounded tree with. You also, then, when you add the dominating vertex to the whole bottom, it still has a bounded tree with. It still doesn't have kh minus 1 t for the same reason. So you, this magical lemma in which I lied a lot, because actually the proof is the longest lemma, gives you that you can color this with h minus 1 colors while saving one color. OK? And then you just poof, do exactly the same thing. You let it go down throw some tomatoes on it. Oh, that's a summary. Removing three islands. OK, so you've seen three of curtains. You raise a curtain. You drop a curtain. Anyways, I think you've seen everything with lots of lying. But um, that is, but the main uh, takeaway, I think, here, and what allows us to solve this was this performing big click sums ahead of time. And the other one was kind of contract erasing, making sure that this is a minor raising this, contracting this into a tree with, and then lots of technical work. The paper is 80 pages long, but we really try to do it. Oh, here how you do it if you want to bound easy proof for h plus 4. And then is, we try to, the, the, these ideas don't disappear in technicalities because this some of the, 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 the three with result that I said that I lied, and I did lie, it's really technical, but, but, it, but it worked. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, uh, well, thank you, Vita. Thank you for a lovely talk. Are, are there any questions? I was wondering if instead of kh, excluding kh as a minor, it might be enough to exclude some other graph of tree width h minus 1. So we extended these results to kst minor free graphs. Um, so those, there we get, uh, so s can be much less, I guess. So there we go, go get s plus 1, that's also tight. That's the only one that I know. But other, but it's true for the other kind of families. I don't. We don't know anything. Do you think it's plausible that just excluding any graph at all of tree with h minus one won't work? H minus. H minus one. So the, the clique has tree with h minus one. That's right. I see. So, so you just want take any other graph. That's really interesting. No, that, I have no idea. That's that, really, but because that would be like a more no. I understand. Thing. I understand. That's really, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know. Well, thank you, Jim. Good question. Any other questions? Uh, so the the final goal would be to have sequel one for the. Oh yes, yes. So that yes. you should ask. Ask. Look. So did you, <laughs> what? What's the dependency in H? For you, do you know? Oh, try to track it, or we shoved all the mess into the size of these components. 
Uh, I, I didn't even think about it, but it has to be this, this Robertson and Seymour exponential. I mean, these click sums that we already have formed ahead of time, they have, they play a role in the trivit of that graph. So the trivit of that graph is probably f of h. So this is probably uh, poof, very far from one, very, very far from one. <laughs> Oh, good question. Thank you. Um, other questions? I did have one, actually. Uh, so list coloring, then. So what, which part mm. of your proof fails for list coloring? Oh, everything fails. I know. This is really sad. I'm really sad about this because you contract. If you contract something, it really fundamentally fails. I don't. So that's why I'm really excited, actually, to see the, the other proof. But in general, this even in the, uh, in the other results that we use in product minus structure theorem where we didn't even contract, um, we never managed to get list coloring. We did this non-repetitive graph colorings directly on the product. But actually, their list coloring is not even true. So, so maybe it's a not good tool for that. It gives you uh, coloring, but not list coloring, but in the class of graphs that cannot be list colored, is non-repetitive coloring. So, but I, I really never got anywhere with this. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank Vida again. Thank you. <laughs>